Open your Bibles up to Titus chapter 2. I want to continue looking with you at this book and of course enter into our next lesson, which is really a focus on, if I may do so, write it right here, younger men. And it's not just any younger men. We're talking about the characteristics that are found in the life of a godly younger man, a Christian young man. The passage we're going to be looking at and focusing in on are verses 6 through 8. Trust you have a Bible with you. Helpful if it's NIV. And I want to read this at this time. This is how it reads. Verse 6. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Uh, the tail end of this passage is, is really in concept um, scattered throughout a number of words. And your packets and your, uh, uh, your, the paper that you have in front of you, of course, the questions and the small group idea um, where you can hash out some of the meaning is going to be very significant, especially in this lesson. I want to walk through, though, and I want to just highlight some uh, particular words that he uses that uh, are really important to the characteristics of a godly younger man. Um, what's interesting is, is there are some similarities between what's going on between godly, now hear this, there's some similarities between what's going on between godly younger women and godly younger men, okay? That it's similar to what's going on between a godly older man and a godly older woman. Back in, uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, he begins with godly older men and he says, hey, teach older men to be, and then he lists those. And when he comes down to verse 3, he uses the term, likewise. So in other words, he says, hey, here's a godly older man, likewise, in other words, in the same manner, okay, in the same way, the exact same deal, hey, godly uh, older women. And then when you come down, there's a natural transition from the godly older woman dumping her life in the godly younger woman, and then you have the characteristics that she's to dump therein, and that's, that was our last lesson. And then he comes and he says in verse 6, similarly, and you can also translate that likewise because it's the exact same word that was used in the transition from the godly older men to the godly younger woman. Okay? If you count that or not. It's the godly older men, and there's a transition to the uh, older uh, women, and then there's the, the godly younger women, and there's a transition to the godly younger men, and that's the, the transition word there is the same word, and it carries with it the idea of, hey, I've said this, and in the exact same way, I'm saying this. So there's, there's, we've been studying this, and it's beyond the scope of what we really want to do here in this session, but there's linkage directly that Paul uses between a godly man and a godly woman, whether it be older or younger, hey, there's a linkage between those. And something that's going on in the man is something that's also going to be going on in the woman. So similarly, he says, at beginning at verse 6, hey, there is encouragement, okay? Let's write this down. Again, the first, uh, 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 what we're going to be looking at uh, is the details of a younger a younger man. And then of course he lists uh, several. And Titus is to encourage them. And we're going to write uh, encouragement up here. And this is a really interesting word. And it's a compound word. And it's really interesting. I kind of like this, especially as a godly younger man. It's a compound word meaning to the side of and call. Compound word. There's two words in the word encouragement that he uses here. And it's the first word we translate to the side of. The second word we translate call. And Paul links those together. Compound word. Two words making up encouragement. To call. How does it go? To the side of and call. And it carries with it the idea of call to the side of or invite to the side of. And so what Paul is doing as he's writing to Titus, he says, listen here. I want you, Titus, to look at. See, Titus is the example. See, Titus is the example of a godly younger man, and he is to look at all the other godly younger men and call them to the side of a Christian godly lifestyle for a godly younger man. It's powerful. So Titus is set there and call them to the side. That's the idea of encouragement. That's the idea, that's the idea he's proposing. It's to call to the side of being a godly younger man. And then he lists several things. The first thing that he lists is to be... Self-controlled. Now, 
I'm very repetitive in teaching. I think it's very helpful. In fact, um, even as we go through the steps, I say things two and three times um, for the idea that you're going to get a hold of this, writing it down, and I don't want you to miss out on this. Um, I find that Paul is the same way in his writings. He's nailing the idea of being self-controlled. Again, we're looking at it in this group. It's the idea of being sober-minded. Are you getting it yet? You are called to be sober-minded. See, um, one of my pet peeves, and I'll bring it up now in the area of the younger men. I meet young guys all the time who uh, um, are just casual. They're aloof about their life. You ask them what God's doing in their life and, and where they're going and where he's leading you. And, uh, you know, hey, where's God leading you? That kind of thing. And, and they're just, well, you know, I don't know. And, and you know, whatever. And, and you're going to go to college? Yeah, I think so. And what are you going to study? I don't know. It's kind of hanging out. And it's unfocused. It's just whatever, whatever comes along, just kicking it, you know. See, that is the absolute opposite of this. See, I like approaching guys and saying, hey, man, what's going on in your life? And they're just like, whoo, <laughs> they're fixed, man. Hey, I'm telling you right now, I've been studying this passage and God's teaching me and I'm going where he wants me to go. I'm going to college and studying it and responding. Wow. See, that's the idea of being sober-minded. It's a powerful concept. He goes on. Yeah, of course, uh, of course, he first starts with the idea of being self-controlled. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. And then he says this. In everything, he says, set them an example, which is a phrase in English. Okay? Set them an, an example. Okay? Which is a phrase in English. But in the original language of our Bible, it's a compound word, which is two, uh, and specifically, two words, okay? It's a compound word, two words, meaning unto, that's the first word, I'll put a star there by it, it's the word unto and the word hold. It's really neat. He says, set them an example. So he takes two words, which is unto and hold, which is the idea of hold unto or hold out. Here's the idea. He's telling Paul, uh, he's tell Paul is telling Titus, and really interesting, see, Paul is always encouraging those who are with him. Uh, we, we, we gather that Titus is a young man from this passage. Timothy was also a young man. Paul says specifically, hey, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Okay? Set them an example. Same idea here to Titus. The powerful passage, uh, if you ever go to youth conferences or what have you, they're going to talk about the passage in the Timothy letters. It's the same idea going on here. Paul says, hey, young men, set them an example, which is a compound word. He takes two words, crams those things together, and comes up with this phrase, setting them an example, which is unto and hold, which literally means, hey, you're holding out something, grabbing hold of something and holding it out for them. And the idea carried across with that is to plainly show off openly something. Okay? What Titus is called to do is set them an example by showing off for them, demonstrating for them the kind of life that he's called to live. And what exactly is he showing off? He goes on and he says, and we could probably slide this underneath uh, set them example because this is what he's to set them an example and he says by doing what is good now okay that's another phrase now again because of the language barrier this is a very difficult passage to work through at least in Greek there's really two words that we want to focus in on in this statement and it's a it's a word there and it's a word there this word here is the idea of the, it, it's, it's the word work, which is what Titus is doing. It's, it's, his, it's his teaching. It's the modeling the lifestyle. It's living after him. It's the instruction. Okay, they're to model that. But the word good here I find really interesting because, well, it can be so ambiguous. As you begin to read uh, through the, uh, especially Titus, but you, uh, the New Testament in general, they tell you to be good, uh, you know, to, to live a good life, good teaching. Here, he says, hey, do what is good. Uh, well, what does that mean? I mean, my mom said, be good. Well, <laughs> was I good? Uh, what does it mean to be good? Does it mean, to, is good defined by not hitting your sister? Um, what's good enough? Uh, mom says, clean the room good. Well, see, everybody's different in how they define being good. See, these are really difficult to define. I really got interested and began to search back into the Gospels. Jesus talks about uh, the sower has his seed, which is the word of God, 
and he's, uh, he's walking along the path and, uh, and he's tossing the seed out, okay? And uh, some of it lands and uh, some of it lands all over the soil and, and some of it lands on rocks, some of it lands among the thorns and you probably know the parable. Um, it's interesting, he says some lands on good soil. Now he doesn't really go into the detail of what was going on in the soil, but it's the soil that he calls good and it reaps a harvest, a huge harvest. And it's really interesting if you grab that imagery. Now, it's not defined implicitly, but if you grab that imagery and you cram it into our passage here of being good, see, what if a godly younger man who is the example by which his wife is to come under, if you remember our last study, if, if a godly younger man is the, is, the, is the lifestyle, he lives a life, he is the one that has been appointed by God to be the head of his household, to be the demonstration of Christ, that literally God chose him to be first the demonstration of the family. What if the husband was to be good just as the soil was good? What if the husband was to be the kind of soil by which God could take his word and plant it in his life and everyone in the family would benefit from it? That's powerful. That's, that's the image. See, that's got to be the image. That's what he's talking about here. Doing what is good. Set that example, Titus. See me, I want, to be the, I want to be the type of soil. I want to live the kind of life where everyone else in my family benefits from Jesus Christ. That he uses me in their life. It's a powerful concept. It's the idea. Setting an example by doing what is good. Now, he goes on and he, he really kind of highlights uh, specifically what Titus has been doing and Titus has been teaching. Okay? I'm going to put it to the side like that. Titus has been, has been teaching. And... Uh, in his teaching, he is to show three particular things. Now, we're not going to go into the idea of teaching because I don't want to lead, I don't want to lead you down the uh, path or down the idea that all, got, all younger godly men should teach. No, that's not so. Paul's specific calling and duty here professionally is, the, is in the area of teaching, okay? And it's in teaching that this lifestyle of a younger man is to shine forth, okay? Just as if you were a, a, a younger godly man and uh, you were a carpenter. Well, not every godly younger man is to be a carpenter. But as in his occupation of being a carpenter, he is to uh, live in a life as an example of a godly younger man in being a carpenter. If that makes sense to you. So what, what Paul does is he takes, being, uh, he takes Titus, who is his primary objective here in ministry is teaching, and he says, listen, I want you to model uh, these qualities. He's been, uh, of course, um, talked about self-control and uh, you know, the doing what is good idea and the setting the example, but he really lists three things in particular, just points them out to Titus, and this is really important, okay? He talks about the first one as integrity. Okay? He says, hey, integrity. Model it in your teaching. Show integrity. The second thing he says is to show seriousness. And the last one is a soundness of speech. Okay? He says, uh, and this is actually how it reads, he says, uh, verse 7, and everything except an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity, serious and soundness, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. Powerful concept there. That cannot be condemned. It literally, uh, you're going to model integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech in a way that cannot be corrupted. See, they cannot hack at that thing. They cannot find fault in that thing. It cannot be condemned. So that, and again, the so that concept is, hey, this is the reason why. You're going to live integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that can't be condemned so that, he says, um, those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Uh, in other words, if someone were to criticize, they would be absolutely ashamed because, hey man, that guy is solid and there's no way to find fault in him. Okay? And he mentions three things. Integrity. The idea of integrity is incorruptible. Okay? It's... Uh, it's literally, uh, I would call it, if, we could, if I could be so bold as just to give it my own definition, I would call it a reputation. I would call it a reputation. Maybe stretching the definition a little bit, but really it's the idea of, uh, uh, it's in, in, incorruptible, it's, 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 it's not fault, it's, 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 you know, it's not corrupted, it's not destroyed, and you have a reputation of that. You're trustworthy. Um, you have a reputation of being, you have integrity, that they can trust you. They, uh, 
They can believe in you. They, they know what you say is true. You have that kind of a lifestyle about you. That's the idea of integrity. In your teaching, he says to Titus, man, you're to model that. Seriousness was a powerful term for me because I always thought that meant like the absence of humor. To be serious, and I'm serious. Okay, that, that kind of an idea. But uh, that really wasn't the, the, the push behind this word at all. In fact, I found it really interesting, the actual, if you can say literal, one of the translations of this word, which is very commonly used, is the word gravity. So, hey, he's to have gravity about him. Does that mean he's to weigh a lot? Well, no. The idea of gravity is, again, in his teaching, which is a spoken verbal type of deal. See, he's to be, he's to have weight, which has to do with he has weight to what he says. He doesn't speak flippantly. Okay? Um, Paul expresses this other places. Uh, all kinds of New Testament, not, uh, even outside of Paul, talks about this. Let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. Don't swear by heaven or earth. Uh, you, know, you don't have to say, yeah, I swear to whatever. You can just say yes uh, or no. And well, you have such weight about you that you don't have to swear. Uh, when someone approaches you and asks you this, you can say yes, and you have your word, and there's an, uh, the, the, you have an integrity in the midst of that. There's weight to what you say. The idea of soundness of speech, literally, again, we, we've looked at this word sound before, it has to do with an intelligible speaking, when you put these two words together, okay? The word sound, really, and then the word speak. It's a intelligible speaking. I really find it interesting that in the scriptures, especially from Paul's perspective and in this book, the responsibility for communication in the home always falls on the male. I've often found it difficult as a, as a young husband um, to communicate to my wife. I found it difficult. Uh, she would come out of the bedroom in the morning and we would be rushing, uh, you know, somewhere. And I'd say, uh, you wearing that? Asking a simple question, are you wearing that? And she would, you know, give me this stance and say, what's wrong with what I'm wearing? Which is not at all what I asked. I didn't, I didn't say, hey, I don't like that. I just said, is that what you're wearing? I'm ready to go. Can we move now out of the house and go? And she took that in a different light. Uh, uh, I asked, are you wearing that? She took, translated that into her mind. He doesn't like my outfit. Um, all kinds of, uh, you know, miscommunication. I used to think it was her fault until I came to the scripture. I used to think, hey, I know what I meant. You're taking it in the wrong way. But when I come in the scripture, the responsibility for communication always falls on the male. He is to have intelligible speaking, soundness of speech. He is to be able to communicate properly. And this is phenomenal because you meet young men today who use vulgar language and, and they can't say five words without dropping uh, some type of uh, profanity, uh, which is taking something sacred and profaning it, like using hell or Jesus, his name in vain. Okay, they're vulgar, uh, you know, all kinds of vulgar language, the F word, uh, just, you know, hey, you know what I'm talking about, the profane and vulgar language. They're just not intelligent enough to communicate. <laughs> Um, they lose their temper. Instead of ex ex uh, communicating how frustrated they are, they just blow up into a series of profane and curse words. They're not able to express themselves. I have no idea why a woman would want to be with a man like that, who when he loses his temper, all he can do is put his fist in it and cuss at it, um, instead of being able to sit down and intelligently being able to communicate how he feels. See, that's a characteristic of a godly younger man. They're not hard to uh, identify. So um, these are the characteristics of a godly younger man. I would just absolutely uh, challenge you, implore you to uh, take these kinds of uh, truths that we're into uh, in these lessons, especially in the area of the young adults and the younger um, teens. Hey, these are the characteristics that we want in our own life or we want to see in the lives of those in whom we give our life to in marriage. Um, appreciate your time.